Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your hot takes, your observations, your questions, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. About 24 hours ago, I posted on the YouTube community tab. Great participation this week as things ramp up. The U.S. Open nears. And before I get started, what a week we have in store for us next week on the channel. I know the tennis kind of dies down after Cincinnati and we start to wait for the U.S. Open. But obviously, Monday match analysis. And then we're going to do a U.S. Open power rankings. Then we're going to do a mailbag on Wednesday. So there's going to be a, a quick turnaround on the mailbag. This week's a Friday mailbag. Next week's a Wednesday. I'm coming right back at you. And then on Thursday... I believe, I haven't checked this actually, but I'm pretty sure the U.S. Open draw comes out. So then it'll be U.S. Open preview. I mean, what a week. No? Looking forward to that. Let's get into this mailbag. First one is from Notka, who's a member. Thanks. Hi, Gil. In the last two few days, I heard three players, Rublev, Medvedev, and Fritz, say that the Wilson balls fly off the racket and are very difficult to control. I don't know this if this is common for Wilson balls, but do you think it's one of the reasons for all the upsets we saw in Toronto and this week in Cincinnati? I noticed that even Yannick, who won Toronto, had a very low first serve percentage, and other players also struggled with their serve. Do you think that this will carry over to the U.S. Open, and if there are certain players who may benefit from it? I saw what Medvedev said. I saw what Fritz said. Daniil, who often complains about the conditions after he loses. I love him, but it's true. You know it's true. He actually said this after a comfortable straight set win over Lorenzo Musetti. Comfortable. And he was like, look, I know I won, but that stunk. Couldn't, couldn't play good tennis. We kept, both of us were missing way too much and the conditions were tough, tough, tough. That's what he said. And then Fritz was like, everybody's talking about it in the locker room, how nobody can control the ball. So who does that benefit? Man, I don't know, but it, it is probably a little bit of an equalizer. At the end of the day, it, it becomes a crapshoot. It's not good for anybody. I'm a little frustrated and there's, there's a limit to how much I can say on this topic because I don't know what's going on. These are Wilson U.S. Open extra duty balls. These have been the same balls, theoretically, at least in theory, the same balls for years and years and years and years. They shouldn't be different this year. And by the way, they should have been the same last week and players weren't complaining last week. They're only complaining this week. And theoretically... For the U.S. Open, same balls. It's frustrating. Australia, Dunlop, same thing. There, there was an issue. A lot of disgruntled players. And I don't understand why this is happening. Because you'd think if you have a tennis ball that players aren't complaining about. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I don't know. These things keep popping up. Yeah, I, I hate to hear it. I hate to hear it. I don't want there to be any issues with the tennis balls. There should not be. So that's all I can say about that. I don't know why. I don't know what the reason is. All right. Next one's from Bruno Alves. Can you just say anything about Rafa? I miss him. Thanks. <laughs> uh, okay. That had 17 likes. All right. A lot of people are asking for me to say something about Rafa's. Or anything about Rafa. Is he going to become the owner of Real Madrid? Not the owner. He's not even that rich. President. I saw that. Is that going to happen? If he becomes the president of Real Madrid, he wins retirement. I know there's a lot of discussion, a lot of talk about what players are going to do after they stop when, when somebody is as meaningful to millions of people like Rafa is. There's always like an interest. Okay, now what? If he becomes the president of Real Madrid, that's the most legendary retirement gig of all time. Not even close. No competition. 
Like, that's the dream. If I could do anything in the world, personally, anything, president of the Knicks, president of the Rangers, president of the Yankees. Because I don't think the president is, like, making all that many important expertise decisions. I don't think there's a lot of personnel decisions, right? Otherwise, Rafa wouldn't be qualified. All right, I don't know if that's true or if it's going to happen, but I did see it. I I really hope it happens for him, okay? And there's our Rafa segment. Also, I saw he got back in, into the uh, into the gym recently. Next one is from Sam Collins. Hey, Gil, I asked this last week, but I would love to hear your top 10 second serves in the top 10. See you at the U.S. Open. Yes, see you there. Maybe I should have said at the top when I was talking about the content plan, as good as next week is going to be, as some of you may remember, it is very difficult for me to make content uh, during the U.S. Open until the semis because I work for U.S. Open Radio. My hours are crazy long. I love it, but it's crazy long. And it's hard to do anything other than that. But I'm going to try my best this year. We'll see. In past years, I haven't really been able to do anything. All right, top 10 second serves. Uh, let me just also read kind of this next comment. Uh, it's from it's from Matthew because it's kind of the same thing. Hey, Gil, I believe a couple of mailbags ago you ranked the top 10's forehands, and I was interested if you could rank their serves, particularly because not one of them are necessarily serve bots, and their serves aren't the most important parts of their game. Another thing that interests me is the mental side of the game, so I was wondering who you thought are the most mentally strong players versus the least, and what makes a player's mind a weapon. Keep up the great content. All right, a couple things on this. First of all, I ranked the top 10 forehands. I couldn't believe how many people in the comments did not understand the assignment. The comment clearly said to rank the forehands in the top 10, not rank the top 10 forehands on tour. It was very clear. And then I made the title because I thought it had a good ring to it. The top 10 Top 10 forehands, which I, I get that it's a little, a little bit unclear, maybe, if you're not paying a lot of attention, which I would understand. But then if you're actually watching it, it's like, do you not notice that the 10 players I said are the 10 players in the top 10? Oh my God. If, if For all the comments that said, why didn't you include Matteo Berrettini? My goodness, folks. Holy moly. All right. This is very hard to rank the top 10 because the serves because some of some of them are pretty negligible. I see a lot of them as the same. While you are right that none of them are serve bots, none of them are actually there are no tier one servers really in the in the top 10. Right? Like no one has Hercotch, Berrettini, Isner, Opelka. Nobody in the top 10 has that. Zverev and Medvedev are not quite there. Uh, Zverev's not in the top 10 right now. Medvedev is not there. Fritz is not there, right? So nobody nobody has that. There are no tier one servers. That said, there are also no bad servers. <laughs> there are no powder puff servers. Like if Demonor breaks into the top 10, below average server. And, and even he could be worse, right? But th there's none of that. So it, it's very hard to rank. They're very close together. How do I weigh first serve versus second serve? Let me focus on first serve. And then I'll go back and talk about their second serves a little bit. And I'm going to try not to... I don't want to spend too much time on one comment. All right. Uh, number one is Fritz, in my opinion. You can, you can look at the stats. Ace rate makes good first serve percentages in. Uh, a really high first serves one percentage, and it's not because of what he does after the serve necessarily. That's a very, very effective serve. That's a big first serve. It's even probably a little bit better than Medvedev's. I'll put Medvedev at two. At three, 
I am going to go with, and it's hard, Pass. Then I'm going to go Djokovic because of the spot serving. Then I'll say Tiafo, who hits a lot of aces, pretty low on the first serve percentage. He he goes big, kind of low percentage, but, you know, it works for him, and it's definitely one of his big weapons. I mean, he holds serve at a really good clip. That's what makes him a great player, not because he breaks serve a whole lot, right? All right, that's five. Six, Rude. Seven, Rublev. What do we got now? Uh, eight, Sinner, although that might change. Another guy, pretty low percentage. Like, he's in the Tiafo range of first serve percentage where it's not great. And it's not really menacing either, like, like foes. So I think there's a dip there. I think Sinner's eight. At nine, it's uh, Runa, I believe. And then at 10, it's Alcaraz. Maybe that underrates Holger's serve. Let's look at ace rate real quick. Let me just check my work here. Because the serve is a shot that you can statistically isolate. So that's a big advantage. Wow, Rude is, has a really low ace rate this year. Very, very low. But I guess the majority of his matches have been on clay this year in particular. Where is... I'm looking for Runa because I'm trying to see... Trying to see if maybe I underrated him at nine. Uh, no, I don't think I did. Yeah, this kind of confirmed what I thought. I mean, he's he's with Nori, Hanfman, Lahechka, Paul. Uh, Rude is lower than him. But other than that, only Alcaraz is lower than him in the top 10. So, okay, I feel pretty good about that. Second serves, I'll just say like Medvedev would be knocked down a peg for his second serve. Djokovic would be up. Alcaraz would be up. Sinner, actually. Sinner would be up. He hits a fast, good, hard second serve. Rude would be elevated. Rublev, at this point, has kind of minimized it as a weakness, but it, he wouldn't be up. He would maybe stay level. Fritz, even level. Tiafo, sure, level. Yeah, I mean, most of the top 10 has a second serve that is really, really solid. Runa, pretty good. Yeah, only Medvedev kind of struggles compared to his first serve. I mean, it's night and day. And uh, I think there's a comment about that. All right, let's move on. From SJ. Hey, Gil, have you heard the quote from Djokovic that goes something along the lines of everyone in the top 10 can hit good forehands and backhands? The difference is mental. As a random tennis YouTube commenter... <laughs> I have to disagree with Djokovic. I think the gap between the best players and the lower ranked players uh, is very clearly linked to technique, and even the flaws in their games can separate the number eight from the number one in the world. I mean, even just watching Zverev versus Medvedev earlier, you can clearly see they have weaknesses that the big four or Alcaraz just don't have, and they are top three or former top three players. Do you think the gap between the lower ranked and higher ranked players is more technical, mental, or even purely physical? Thanks for the analysis, and enjoy the race to the fourth seed. It's really heating up. <laughs> All right, more on that later. I got to mention that. That's hilarious. Uh, okay. I am not a fan at all of isolating the whole, like, is it technical? Is it mental? Is it physical? I, I just think it's obviously everything. It's a case by case. I can give you guys who are outside of the top 50... And I can be like, physical is what holds them back. I can look at someone right next to them in the rankings, and I can be like, oh, awesome athlete. It's Fuchovic. Physical is not what holds them back. Technical is what holds them back. Or mental is what holds them back. And a lot of the times, it's even more nuanced than that. And I can't even give you one definitive. Ultimately, I think the point that Novak is trying to make, which is a point that I can agree with, is that when the chips are down, and you're playing with pressure, stakes, crowd, strategy, tactics. 
uh, for a really, really long time. You have to focus. You have to endure. You have to manage emotions. That's a tennis match, right? Hitting the ball back and forth in practice. Yeah, the world number 75 can do that too. At, and it's very impressive. But between Novak and the world number 75, th they both hit great. They both move great. The difference is who's going to win a tennis match. Uh, and that is, I think, what Novak is really trying to say when he's saying that tennis is all mental. It'd be nice to ask him about it. Maybe follow up. That'd be that'd be great. Because uh, the the quote you're talking about, let me let me find it exactly, just so we have him precisely on record. Yeah, I don't know where or when he said it, but it comes up on the internet as quote: "Tennis is a mental game. Everyone is fit. Everyone hits great forehands and backhands." There you have it. The race to the four seed, really heating up. Yeah. So. A couple of mailbags ago, I think somebody asked who's going to get the four seed. And I was like, wow, great question. Awesome storyline. Buckle up, strap in. Here we go. Canada, Cincinnati, 255 points separated number four in the rankings and number seven in the rankings. Here's what... Those four players, four, five, six, seven, 255 points. Here's what they did. Rude went one and two. Tsitsipas went one and two. Runa went 0 and two with a retirement. And Rublev went 0 and two. None of them won two matches in the last two weeks. I remember when I was answering the question... I was kind of like scratching my head and I'm like, uh, you know, it's a lot about how many points they're defending. And I, I'd have to look at the math here. And it's hard for me to do it off the top of my head. But I'm like, oh, Runa, he stunk last year at this time. He didn't win any matches. So maybe he can do it. Well, that's what happened. Runa won zero matches, but he didn't lose any points. And everybody else lost a lot of points. So Runa is the four seed at the U.S. Open. Unless somebody plays Winston-Salem next week. Not going to happen. But I thought I'd just maybe put it out there so that I'm not just saying something that turns out to be dead wrong. So yeah, what a race to the fourth seed it was. Truly, truly remarkable. Here is a comment from Apple Podcasts. If you want to leave a comment on Apple Podcasts, uh, please, please do. I will get to it. It also helps the show gain more visibility. So it's a it's a win-win. Ask those mailbag questions on Apple Podcast Reviews. Unfortunately, you can only really do it once, though. All right. Mailbag question. Rewatching the highlights of Alcaraz Medvedev at Wimbledon, it was amazing to see how Alcaraz could run him around the court, especially on his serve, because Medvedev had so much space to cover on each shot. Carlos was given every opportunity to be creative. Carlos's willingness to be creative is crucial for this matchup. Playing Medvedev is tricky for a lot of players. Certain players like Alcaraz thrive when asked to be creative on court, but others sort of freeze. Medvedev's few negative head-to-heads with any player... Um, shows how, wait, any player 14 over three matches. I don't get that part, but show how difficult he makes it to pull this off against him. Some examples to highlight this effect. Alcaraz is, he's one and two against Alcaraz. Kyrgios, one and four. Manorino, three and four. Federer, zero oh and three. Sinner, six and oh. Hachinov, four and one. Rublev, five and two. Zverev, nine and six. Nine and two since 2019. Uh, update to that, that's nine and seven. This comment was before Zverev got the win. So the question here is, one of the biggest requirements to defeat Medvedev, a willingness to create. Uh, do Manorino, Simone, and RBA have a different approach? Medvedev is just such a unique player with such distinguished strengths and weaknesses that, yeah, it's kind of easy to see what bothers him and what doesn't, what beats him and what doesn't. And I don't know if creation is really what I 
what I, I point to. I mean, yes, there are players who offensively, you do have to be able to create, but it's also how you create. Because Rublev and and Fritz and Sinner, they do create pace. They create pace. They do generate in that way. Uh, but but Medvedev is immune to pace. You can't rush him, and you really can't hit through him unless you open up the court in a very intelligent way. But ultimately, if you want to beat Medvedev with offense, you better get to the net. You better get to the damn net offensively. You point out, though, that there's another style of tennis player that tends to give Medvedev trouble, like a Manorino or an RBA. And these players take the exact opposite approach. They take Medvedev out of his comfort zone, not because they are defeating his often impenetrable defense, but because they are asking him to tap into his less comfortable offense. They are not allowing him to do what he loves to do, especially on return, which is just stay solid and get the error. Wait for the error. Counterpunch, which he's so good at. I mean, his game is predicated around each and every point. Come up with something great. Come up with something great. Come up with something great. And he asks you again and again and again and again. That's his return strategy. Unfortunately, when he plays Gilles Simone, Simone is not looking to come up with something great. He's not going to make an error. He's going to hit Medvedev with the same exact mentality. And it's either they're going to have a physical war where it's first to collapse, loses, last to collapse, wins. Or Daniil is going to have to try to create himself, which is not what he likes to do. Also, flat hitters. Let's also uh, acknowledge that. Low contact points, bad for Daniil. He doesn't, he doesn't want to hit the ball from low contact points. He's a flat hitter. His ball is much less effective when he has to lift up. He'd much rather hit it straight on a line. Very, very flat. And in order to do that, you need those high contact points. So heavy topspin, bad against Medvedev. Uh, if you can keep the ball really, really low, if you can slice, good against Medvedev. So there's a lot of quirks. There's not one way to beat Daniil. But he's definitely somebody who has their easily identifiable positive matchups and negative matchups. Next one's from Andy. Hey Gil, regarding Andy Roddick's reaction on a discussion whether amateur players would take a game slash point against professionals, I personally agree with Roddick the way he talked about it 100%, but I was wondering if you had six months of preparation for a scheduled match against a top 200 player, your goal being winning one game in best of three sets, I mean, let's edit that to two sets because I'm, I'm only getting to play two sets, uh, what would you work on the most to have a chance to pull it off. For those of you who didn't see, and it makes me sick to my stomach to have to read you these numbers, but Action Network, which is a company that uh, sophomore year of college I interned for when they were just a wee little startup. Shout out to them. They're killing it now in the, uh, in the media game. Uh, they did a, a survey and the results were that 71% of tennis players, amateur tennis players, believe that they can win a game against the average pro. 82% of tennis players 18 through 24 think that they could win a game against a professional. 47% of tennis players above the age of 55 think they could win a game against a professional. The delusion is nauseating. The disrespect is palpable. And it hurts me to read those numbers. It hurts me that there can be such 
a horrific misunderstanding. I'll leave it at that because uh, if you watch the segment on TC Live, Andy Roddick and Andrea Petkovic, they said everything. They said everything necessary. Okay, that said, if I had six months to train, ooh, this would be fun. Look, I don't think there would be that much strategy to it other than let's work on everything. Let's get in the best shape possible. Let's play a lot of matches. And let's play a lot of matches against people who are going to whoop my butt. Because uh, let's get used to that feeling. The speed, the pace, the movement on the other side of the net. Let's let's get used to all of that. Because if I if I play a bunch of matches against fellow amateurs... It's only going to get me so far. It's going to feel completely different when I get on the court against that pro. So it would be play a lot of practice sets against someone who's way, way, way better than me. There would be no better preparation than that so that I could just get comfortable in that setting. But ultimately, like if you're talking about a training strategy, it's pro it would probably be wise for me to spend a lot of time on on the serve and especially on the first serve probably go to first serve strategy and hope I I have a game where I I make a bunch because my kick serve while it's maybe one of the better parts of my game against the people who I actually compete against it's it's lunch for a professional so I probably shouldn't hit it as my second serve. I should probably hit two first serves. And I think it would be important to to really work on the first serve because, you know, you got to play excellent first strike tennis. There's there's no, no other way, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I think one of the traps that players fall into when they play players who are much, much better than them is uh, they're trying to, like, just hit a great ball every time and they just start missing a ton and it's kind of like all right don't don't lose your mind here like play tennis don't just miss every ball that's not helpful so like even when i was young and i would play my coaches who are much better than me i think that would be uh an issue you know you gotta you gotta play somewhat within yourself but i still think two first serves would be the call and i mean i think return you know is such a hopeless task you're not going to break serve why why focus on that? Like, let's really focus on the surf, I think would be my strategy. Hi, Gil. According to what we've seen so far this season, it seems like Runa's worst surface is outdoor hard. Why is he struggling on that particular surface? And what should he do in order to have success on the most common type of court on tour? Yeah, the fact is he's never made a big quarterfinal on outdoor hard courts. Acapulco semifinal, Australian Open round of 16. I believe Indian Wells or Miami, one of them he made the round of 16. I'm kind of forgetting which one. But yeah, it hasn't been great. I mean, look, I think it was Miami. I think... Uh, on the clay, it seemed like he at least knew what he wanted to do and how he was looking to play. Which is be a be a real problem defensively. You know, hit that heavy high RPM forehand into the righty backhand. You know, look for the short ball if you get it, sure. Step in for your backhand drop shot. Step in for your forehand approach, maybe. But at the end of the day, like Runa, I think from a shot selection standpoint, knew exactly what he was doing on the clay. And that clarity just really hasn't existed on other surfaces. Now, when it comes to indoor hard courts, we obviously have last fall to look to. And, you know, in that case, it was... The best I've ever seen Holger serve. The best I've ever seen him hit his forehand. He was hitting second serves 110 miles per hour. Uh, I, I don't know. It's just... It's hard to make sense of it at this point. Because we haven't really seen him play that well. That 
that way effectively since. It was a lot of, you know, really massive first serves, first strike tennis from from Runa. And it's like, where has that been all year? That That's not really his thing this year. He's very confusing. Obviously got injured, so I don't know. Uh, small sample size here after Wimbledon, two matches. One of them's a retirement. You kind of shrug your shoulders. But while it's 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 been somewhat frustrating to at times feel like I don't have Holger Runa figured out, I don't know if he has himself figured out. So in that respect, maybe I should cut myself some slack. Uh, from Hank Jesse, not sure if you've touched on this before, but do you have any thoughts on the Cincinnati Open moving? I'm super disappointed. I live in Kentucky, and it's always been super cool that in a sport played on an international level, there's such a big tournament that is easily accessible for people in the Midwest. All tennis in the U.S. is coastal, and I feel like for the growth of the sport in the U.S., it's good to have a tournament more towards the middle. Yeah. That is something that is cool about Cincinnati. You know, the U.S., people will complain about the U.S. having too many tournaments, and I get it. But then you remember, you know, the U.S., geographically, it is like kind of Europe-sized. And then when you think about that, you realize, okay, we're not over-serving a small group of people by any means. Uh, if you live in... A large portion of the U.S., Cincinnati is your closest tournament, and it it might not even be all that close. So that is uh, certainly a, a value proposition when it comes to Cincy is, is its location. But let me talk about what's going on. This whole move thing to Charlotte is not a done deal yet. Uh, the group who bought the license to the tournament from the USTA, which is called uh, BMOC, uh, BMOC Capital, they want to basically rebuild the tournament, invest in the tournament, make it bigger, and rebuild it. Uh, so they're going to do that. They want a local government to help them with the cost. So, you know, use taxpayer money, right? The uh, a legislature will approve it for the budget and then taxpayer money will contribute to BMA Capital's renovation of a new look Western and Southern Open. That's how this works. And the reason why the taxpayers agree to it and the city agrees to it is because it does bring economic value having the tournament. Right now, what it looks like is BMA Capital is going to put both the city and the states are involved here. Uh, Mason, the city of Mason and the state of Ohio, and they're going to pin those governments against the city of Charlotte, the state of North Carolina. And it's going to go to the highest bidder is probably how this is going to play out. Whoever is willing to pay BMA Capital more money and give a larger investment is probably going to get the tournament. Yeah, that's how this is playing out. I hope Cincinnati wins it. I hope Cincinnati comes through on this. Um... Especially because the infrastructure in a lot of ways is already there. The tradition is already there. And I don't want to see that area suffer that kind of loss. I really don't want to see that. Um, I hope that if the Masters 1000 does indeed move to Charlotte, then you know maybe Cincinnati can, can get some other kind of license and, and host a, another tournament maybe in February or something, but I don't know uh, because, you know, it is a massive, like the Linder Family Tennis Center. Here's a fun fact. It is the only tennis facility 
in the in the world, I believe, with three permanent tennis stadiums. Now, I don't know how large something needs to be before it, it you know, for it to be deemed a stadium. But it is the only outside of the Grand Slams. It is the only tennis facility in the world with three or more permanent tennis stadiums. There are three stadiums at over four thousand capacity, so it's uh, it's pretty big. From as. Manzer. Hi, Gil. What are your thoughts on Medvedev's serve? He's not been himself serve-wise after 2021, with plenty of double faults, especially in crunch moments. It used to be one of his biggest weapons, as it should be given his height, but now it seems to be no longer the case, and it significantly holds him back as of late. Why do you think his serve has gotten has gotten worse so much, and how do you think he could work on his second serve? Is it more of a mental issue, or is his a new serve technique? Thanks for the content. Loving it. It's been an issue recently. There's no doubt about it. He's lacked confidence. Now, let's dig into the numbers. I do want to... The one bone I have to pick with the premise of the comment is I don't think Medvedev's second serve has been good ever. Good in moments, maybe. But I don't think it's ever really actually been good. Statistically, how about this? Double fault rate, same as last year. Uh, but worse than 2019, 2020, 2021. So you have to go back to 2018 and 2017 when his double fault rate uh, was around where it is now, which is 5.1%. Uh, let's see. Second serve win percentage, though, that's down. That's actually the worst it's been. His second serve win percentage is the worst it's been since 2017. It was better in 2018. So that that's a big stat. Overall, his hold percentage is not what it's been. It's not as good as it's been, for the most part. But the break percentage is excellent. And much, much better than last year. The big difference between Medvedev this year... I'm just looking at the stats. The big difference between Medvedev this year and Medvedev last year is how often he's breaking serve. He's actually breaking serve at a higher clip this year than he did in 2019 and 2020. That said, uh, we are kind of coming off the clay court season, and maybe that number goes down as the year goes on and they play on quick surfaces. Maybe, but for Medvedev, I don't even know if that's the case. But he does not, he's never been comfortable hitting a, a, a heavy kick serve. His kick serve has always been slow. And right now, I think for the most part, he's not really hitting the slow kick serve. He's hitting the low margin slice serve for the second. And he seems to be in a bit of a mental rut where the double faults are coming in bad moments. Definitely something that I think is a concern heading into the U.S. Open. From Ioliva. Just realized, no lefties in the top 10, one lefty in the top 20. This is wrong. Please discuss with your fellow tennis analysts. Who are my fellow tennis analysts? Otto? Otto over there? Am I going to ask Otto what he thinks? Or she? Otto doesn't have a gender, actually. Well, technically, 10% of people on the planet are lefties. Which means there should only be two in the top 20. And there's only one. So it's not that far off. That said, Chapeau, Draper, where you at? Where you at? Especially, well, both of them. Uh, unfortunately, Chapeau, I think, pulled out of the U.S. Open. His his knee has been uh, 
bad this year. He he can't get that knee healthy. Draper came back in Vancouver, so uh, hopefully Jack is is looking good at the U.S. Open. I mean, spoiler alert, he's probably going to be a dark horse. He's always a dark horse, right? I mean, how could he not be? All right. From Angelos. Hi, Gil. After seeing Alexi Popperin string a good run of results here in Cincinnati in the quarterfinals currently and potentially potentially could go further, and also lifting the Umag title in impressive fashion in the final against Stan, what do you think his ceiling is as a player? Can you see him cracking the top 20 soon? Well, he's definitely been underachieving for what his talent is. I said this after the Umag final, but you look at how good his first serve is, how well he moves, even the forehand, that alone, he should be a lock in the top 50. He has no business, no business being out of the top 50 with those assets. But last year, he could barely win a match at tour level. I think at times the backhand has been uh, a real sabotage shot. Like it's a, it's been a, a huge, huge weakness. And I think he's managed that better. He's mentally tougher. He's making better shot selection decisions. He's playing very deep in the court. I don't know if he's always been doing that, but he's given himself some extra time to load up that forehand and to find his forehand. He just seems a lot more mature in general, more professional nowadays with the way he's carrying himself and all that as well. That said, I do have to see more. I mean, you're looking at Umag, it, it's post-Wimbledon clay. So I'm never really going to put huge uh, huge weight into that, although, you know, it, it's always big for somebody to win a title, and I, I was really, really impressed with how he played in the final against Stan, but he, you know, Cincinnati here, right, didn't play Canada. Uh, Cincinnati, lucky loser, lost to Max Purcell, who's just balling, so you could excuse that. He beats Altmaier in three, gets a walkover against Jari, and beats Rusevori in three. Loses to Hurkacz here. Almost won the second set. Lost the first easily. I mean, look, I, I got to see a lot more than that before I get too excited, right? But I do think, I think at some point, sure, that's a top 20 talent. So I think at some point he'll be top 20. I don't think he'll ever be top 10. And he should be. I'll go as far as saying he should be at some point top 30. Top 20? Maybe, maybe not. From Alex. I asked a similar question last week, but what are your thoughts on Demon Orr's game? How does he need to improve to get to the next level? And also, how impressive was his run to the National Bank Open final? My thoughts on Demon Orr's game. That's a, that's a, very, that's a very large question. A lot of thoughts. I don't know if I want to give like a complete rundown of his game right now. Uh, but what does he need to improve is is a pretty tough question. Because his technique suggests that a lot of his baseline limitations are never going to get any better. He's never going to have more power on the backhand, I don't think. Or more power on the forehand when he's unable to set his feet. Not to mention... He'll never be a big, strong guy. So I don't think the baseline power is ever getting better. And then you kind of look at his game. Oh, the serve. The serve technique also. Like the serve technique would need a pretty big revamp for that to become a big serve. In fact, uh, let me shout out Hugh Clark, a thread of order substack. He actually goes more into the technique than I usually do. He's good. And he talked about Demonor. It was good, uh, good analysis. He's not going to hit the ball much bigger anytime, right? So mentally, the guy can't be better. He's awesome. Physically, he's he's great. He's not getting any better. Technically, 
I think he's become a really good game planner. Very, very good at understanding kind of how to play based on who's on the other side of the net when it comes to, you know, do I do I want to stay very solid and be a counter puncher or do I want to be a net rusher like I was against Neil Medvedev? That's good stuff. Man, he doesn't have that much to improve. And that's why I don't think like it's a massive coincidence that he tends to have moments where he breaks into the top 20 and then he kind of leaves the top 20 and then he comes back in. I think a good goal for him will just be like, let's stay where you are now, which is like around 12 in the world. I think that's about where he should be. And if he can stay there for a long, 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 long time, he's going to have great, great moments like he had last week. If I were him, that would be my outlook. Not how do I get to the next level? Because frankly, I just don't see it. I don't think it can happen. All right, I think I'll leave it at that. As I said, big next couple five or six days of content. Hit the bell if you don't want to miss any of it. Hit the join button if you want to support the channel. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.